All right, let me make sure that we have this thing on. Okay, guys, just uh, kinds of questions that I've been getting. A lot of you are trying to find shortcuts. Uh, there aren't any shortcuts, guys. There's no shortcuts in terms of the material that you have in your hand because, as I told you, this is a distillate of 25 years of teaching, and it's down to the bare minimum. So don't come up and ask me, okay, I only have this amount of time for the ex uh, you know, before to study. You know, what do I need to study? What don't I need to study? I can't answer that. Okay, I cannot answer that because everything in there has some meaning to it. Okay? And so, as I told you, if you can get through all those notes, and plus the ones, the other ones from other people on that, your score should be high. If you can't get through all of them, then obviously it could potentially be lower because you wouldn't have come across it. That's all I can tell you. So don't, don't, don't ask me for any tricks because I would try to give you the tricks if I knew what they were. There aren't any. Okay? I don't come up and say, do I need to know this? Okay? Uh, basically, I'll just say it right now. Yes. Okay? Okay, that's the answer. So don't ask me. <laughs> okay, because then other people that want to ask questions never get a chance to because we're busy wondering about whether that's going to be asked. I didn't write the questions on the boards. Okay, so I don't know. All I know is what you tell me was on your exam, and they're in your high yields. Okay? And, and, uh, and then I put them in the notes. And I put them in notes. So I can tell you. I can tell you that they work because I have a pretty good track record. Okay, so... That's all I can say. So let's move on. I'll have to get to make this a little brighter when I get back home. But you have this uh, slide on uh, B12 and folate. And so we're on macrocytic anemias now. This is very important. Now, this is really biochemistry, okay? So I'm not going to go too crazy on it, just enough so that you can understand why B12 and folate are involved in DNA synthesis. That's the key you want to remember. If you're B12 and folate deficient, then what's going to happen is you're not going to be able to make DNA, specifically uh, because you have a, a problem with making uh, this TMP over here. Okay, what does that stand for? Deoxythymidine monophosphate. Can't make it. Okay? So if you can't make that, that means that you're not going to be able to mature that nucleus. Remember, immature nuclei don't have a whole lot of DNA in them. But as you make DNA, they become more mature and the nucleus starts getting smaller and smaller and more condensed. Okay? So, because of the fact that you cannot make the DNA, then you have this big old nucleus that never matures that makes all the nucleated cells in your body big. That's why these are called megaloblastic anemias. A good pathologist has diagnosed B12 and folate deficiency in a cervical pap smear. And you're looking at the squamous cells and say, golly, look at the size of those nuclei. They're huge. You call up and say, hey, you know, what do you know about this lady? And you oftentimes can make a diagnosis of folate and or B12 deficiency. Guys, any cell that has a nucleus has DNA in it. Okay. And so all, any cell with a nucleus is big. So it's not just the uh, hematopoietic cells that are huge. All the nucleated cells in the body are huge. GI, squamous cells, all of them because they all have DNA. Okay? All right. Now, another name, by the way, for B12 is cobalamin. Sometimes they use that term rather than uh, vitamin B12. And the reason why they do that is cobalamin, uh, uh, B12 has cobalt in it. And so they use the term cobalamin. That's another name for B12. Okay. So that's what this CBL is over here. Okay, now, um, the circulating form of folate is called methyl tetrahydrofolate. Tetra means four. Okay, and that's what this is up here. This is circulating um, folate. The purpose of cobalamin is to take the methyl group off of methyl tetrahydrofolate. Kind of a menial task of B12, and that's why it gets so irritated with it. But it takes the methyl group off methyl tetrahydrofolate. Okay, so here we go. 
took it off. Now it's called methyl cobalamin. And now methyl tetrahydrofolate is now called tetrahydrofolate. All right. We don't get the methyl group off of folate, we're not going to make DNA. It's basically that simple. So if you're B12 deficient, you can't get the methyl group off, you ain't going to make DNA. You're deficient in folate, you ain't going to make DNA. You need both of them because cobalamin has to take the methyl group off. All right. It's like rugby. You know, lateral passes. Okay. The British play rugby, we play football. They call that football, we call it rugby here. Okay? And so, cobalamin gives the methyl group and it adds it to homocysteine. When you add a methyl group to homocysteine, it becomes methionine. Now, some of you know, because you've been close to biochemistry, that methionine is the amino acid that you want to have for one carbon transfer reactions. So, if you say, I need a carbon, and you say, get methionine to come because it gives you a carbon. Remember, methyl is CH3. It's a carbon. And so, methionine, you're going to find out in your biochemistry lectures, uh, carries one extra carbon with it that it will give to biochemical reactions that need an extra carbon. Okay, that's going to be very important in biochemistry, as you will find. But even more important than that, I'm going to ask you a question. If you're a B12 or folate deficient, I want you to tell me what the serum homocysteine level is going to be. It's going to be high, guys. Now, everyone in this room should know what the meaning of a high serum homocysteine level is. Because that's big time news. Public radio has it. They always talk about homocysteine. Homocysteine. What's the big deal about homocysteine? It produces thromboses, including myocardial infarctions. Homocysteine damages endothelial cells predisposing them to thrombosis, which includes myocardial infarctions. Mm. So the natural question is, what's the most common cause of an increase in homocysteine? Do you think it would honestly be homocysteinuria, a rare autosomal recessive genetic disease? I sincerely doubt it. What do you think it is? Well, the answer is either going to be B12 deficiency or folate deficiency. Which of the two is more common? Folate. So what's the most common cause of an elevated plasma or serum homocysteine level in the United States? Folate deficiency. Having said that, am I also saying that people with B12 and folate deficiency have an increase in incidence of thrombosis and myocardial infarction? Yes. Yes. That's why in big centers, not usually in small community hospitals, cardiologists order serum homocysteine levels. But usually the general uh, internists and stuff like that usually don't do that. But in bigger places, they do. And the most common cause of an elevated homocysteine level is folate deficiency. And I hope you can see why. Okay, if you're folate deficient, then you're not going to have a methyl to add the homocysteine to become, uh, and so uh, you're not going to have a methyl group over here. Okay, so you, you, uh, uh, homocysteine is going to be increased. If you have B12 deficiency, Okay, you're not going to have a, a, a methyl group and to make homocysteine methionine, it's increased. So either way, you have folate or B12, it's increased. All right, now let's just follow. So we don't have to really go crazy about this thing. Tetrahydrofolate seems to be the, the start of this cycle. And we go around here, and we have a nice little reaction that I'm sure Hanson will go through. And we've got this little compound over here. And we've got this... Uh, thymidylate synthetase here. So we know this is where the DNA is made. It starts with this little, this little substrate over here. And we have this enzyme over here. And we convert this DUMP to DTP. That's DNA. So this is the substrate that's necessary to act upon to form your DNA. Okay, so when uh, it is used in the making of DNA, it is opted and it's called dihydrofolate. Now you already know. It's already starting little bells. It's starting to go, dihydrofolate. I remember that English guy that was teaching us in pharmacology. And he said something about an enzyme called dihydrofolate reductase, which converts the oxidized dihydrofolate back to tetrahydrofolate. <sighs> and you learned that there were lots of drugs that blocked dihydrofolate reductase, didn't you? You learned that methyltrexate did. You learned that trimethyl sulfamethoxazole did. There's piles of things that inhibit dihydrofolate reductase. Therefore, if they do that, then what's going to happen to DNA synthesis? Decrease, and what kind of anemia are you going to have? Macrocytic. There you go. 
Okay? So that's how it all comes together. So you need B12 and folate to make DNA. The function of B12 is to take the methyl group away from methyl tetrahydrofolate and hand it off to homocysteine to become a dynein. Okay? And then it, you have tetrahydrofolate that starts off the cycle for making DNA. And that's how it works. Okay? Now, B12 is humiliated by having to just transfer methyl groups. And so it said, may I have something different to do that's important? Well, and then so whoever he asked this thing to said, that's an odd request. It's an odd request? Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, because we really do need you for something. Like what? Well, it turns out that we can take care of even chained fatty acids and metabolize them with no problem. In other words, those that have 2, 4, 6, 8, no, the even chain. But we're having a problem with the odd chain fatty acids because we only can break them down at the proprioneal coa. That's it. And we can't go any further. And we're ending up with a lot of people with dementia and all that stuff. Can you help us in odd chain fatty acid metabolism? So B12 actually is impressed with this. You mean, if I don't want to volunteer for this thing, that people are going to be demented? and have some kinds of problems with, you know, proprioception and all that. Oh, yes, yes, it's very important. Very important. Would you do it? Sure. And so it's involved in propionate metabolism, which is odd chain fatty acid metabolism. And here it is. Here's propionates. Remember, you always acetylate them. And then that forms methylmalonyl-CoA. And here's where our little friend comes in. And now B12 comes in right over here in the conversion of methylmalonyl-CoA into succinyl-CoA. I'm going to have to put it in there. It should be right there. Uh, and uh, it's uh, and then of course succinyl CoA is in the TCA cycle. Cool. So it helps convert methylmalonyl CoA into succinyl CoA. That's what B12 is. It's a cofactor for that particular enzyme right over there. Okay. Can you see then that if you're B12 deficient, there's a certain thing going to build up. Certainly methylmalonyl CoA will build up, and certainly the propionates are going to uh, uh, build up. Is that correct? And methylmalonyl CoA becomes methylmalonic acid which, as you know, is a very, very sensitive and very specific test for B12 deficiency. It will increase. And so whenever you have a situation where B12 levels are equivocal in the blood, always get a methylmalonic acid level because that will never fail you. It will always be increased. So the reason why you get neurologic problems in B12 deficiency, guys, is because you're of the propionate metabolism. If you don't have B12 here, then you can't convert these odd-chain fatty acids into succinyl CoA. And so they build up, and it screws up myelin. You can't make, you can't synthesize myelin. And so what ends up happening is you end up with dementia, you end up, end up with demyelination of the posterior columns and of the lateral cortical spinal tract. Okay? You do myelin stains on the spinal cord, you see no myelin in the posterior column, you see no myelin in the lateral cortical spinal tract. Gone because of this. And so because of dorsal or posterior column disease, you have problems with proprioception, you have problems with vibratory sensation, then you knock off the lateral cortical spinal tract, and you have problems with upper motor neuron problems, spasticity, Babinski signs, and then to throw add insult to injury, you have dementia. All of these things are related to B12, not folate, because it's not involved in propionate metabolism. And what they're going to hammer in your heads on boards, one, two, and three, is they will always tell you that you can have B12 deficiency, and you can correct the anemia with high doses of folate, but you can't correct the neurologic disease. So you must make a specific diagnosis. Otherwise, you could be led down a bad path here, and you think that you have uh, a folate deficiency because you corrected the hematologic conditions, and didn't re uh, and, and, but you really had B12 deficiency. Okay. Now I'm going to give you uh, uh, an interesting uh, concept that you may not have heard before. About a year ago, they were talking about patients with Alzheimer's disease, some of which improved a little bit with injection of vitamin B12. You want to know why they improved a little bit? Because they didn't have Alzheimer's disease. That's the cause of their dementia, that B12 deficiency. Have you heard anything else about that wonderful study since then? No. No. You see, here's the bad part. Mayo Clinic proceedings made probably the best article on B12. You don't have to have anemia with B12 deficiency, but you can have the neurologic disease. Moral of the story, anyone in this room, in working up a patient that has dementia, that doesn't get a TSH, true hypothyroidism, and doesn't get a B12, 
two rule out B12 deficiency, you're going to get yourself in big time problems somewhere down the pike. Because those are reversible causes of dementia. Okay? So that's the moral of that story. Very important that you understand that. Okay. I think that's enough on this. Let's discuss just the normal metabolism of B12. Remember, it's an animal product. So you cannot be a pure vegan and get B12. Okay? It's got to be an animal product. In fact, there was a specific question recently comparing a pure vegan to an ovo-lacto-vegetarian. <laughs> okay? And you had to know what the difference was. Well, the answer is if you're an ovo-lacto-vegetarian, you're taking dairy products as an animal product, you would not have to be on B12 supplements. But if you're a pure vegan, and you're, that which means that you purely take vegetable products and no dairy or meat products, you would require B12. So Borg is on to this, okay? Borg is on to this. Okay, so we have to eat meats or dairy products that have B12. The very first thing you do when you're chewing is it binds to R factor, R is in Robert factor, in saliva. Now, the purpose of the R factor is to bind the B12 to protect it from getting destroyed by acid in your stomach. Probably most of you may have even heard of R factor. I didn't until I read the article in Mayo Clinic Proceedings, and then all of a sudden R factor started coming around. I know you're wondering about intrinsic factor, aren't you? You're saying, what about intrinsic factor? Are you sure he's not screwing that up? No, I'm not screwing it up. Okay? So the R factor protects the B12 from being destroyed. Intrinsic factor is made by parietal cells. I want you to tell me exactly where they're located. Are they pylorus antrum or body fundus? Body fundus. That's where parietal cells. And they make two things, don't they? Acid and intrinsic factor. All right. Intrinsic factor isn't destroyed by acid, so it doesn't need anything to protect it. So the B12 uh, R factor complex goes into the duodenum where there's intrinsic factor waiting for it. Okay, so now how are we going to get intrinsic factor to bind with B12? Well, we've got to cleave off the R factor. So that means we have to have a functioning pancreas to do that with enzymes that will cleave off the R factor. So now B12 can say, hello, intrinsic factor. Hello, B12. Bonk. Okay. They are complex. Now what do they do? They take a long trip. Do they go to take a trip in the duodenum? No. That's iron country. When they hit the, uh, the uh, ligament of trites, which is the beginning of the jejunum, are they going to get hit there? No. Because that's folate country. So they have to go all the way to the terminal ileum where there are receptors for intrinsic factor, and that's where it gets reabsorbed. That's the same place you reabsorb bile salts, isn't it? That's the same place that Crohn's disease hit, doesn't it? So is it fair to say that if you have Crohn's disease, you have bile salt deficiency with concomitant malabsorption, and you also have B12 deficiency? Right off the bat. Yes or no? That's a board question. Okay. So that's how it works. Now, the most common cause of all this stuff is pernicious anemia, which is an autoimmune disease with destruction of the parietal cells. There's actual autoantibodies against the parietal cell. There's even autoantibodies against intrinsic factor. And it destroys the parietal cell. Where did you say there was? Body and fundus. Do you think it just knocks those off like Dirty Harry? Or do you think that there's an autoimmune response and destroys them? Everyone around them also gets knocked off. What do you think it is? Is it a Sylvester Stallone, Arnold Schwarzenegger thing? Or do you think it's a Dirty Harry? Just knock off the parietal cell and just suddenly disappear. What do you think? Everything gets destroyed. And so you end up with an atrophic gastritis of the body and fundus. No parietal cells, no acid. That's called achlorhydria. No intrinsic factor. Ooh. They spit on him. I got over here. He, he saw it. He was listening to me attentively and all of them. <laughs> Don't worry, it's sterile. <laughs> I got a best second. Everything's sterile. Okay. I'll stay over here. Okay. That's the danger of sitting in the front row, by the way. Anyone that wears glasses usually has to clean them at the end of the day. There's little specks on them. They say, why don't I get my glasses all night? It's spit. It's spit. Okay. It's spit. Okay, I'll just tell you the truth. It's spit. All right. Whatever. Okay. Where were we? It destroys everything there. 
And so you have an atrophic gastritis of the body and fundus. Yes, no acid. And what was that predisposed to? Cancer. Achorhydria is a major predisposing cause for gastric adenocarcinoma. So we see that as a potential complication too. Okay? Now, what else? Well, you could be a pure veggie and develop B12 deficiency. Okay? What else? Oh, you can have chronic pancreatitis. Who do you see that commonly in? Alcoholics. Why would that produce B12 deficiency? Can't cleave off the R factor. That could be another cause of B12. We have a giant worm called a, a, a fish tapeworm called Diphylobotrum lutum. Okay, I can just see it with its mouth open like this. And that, and that was B12 intrinsic factor complex. Get a life, worm. I mean, there's other things to eat. Okay? So we got that one. And that's common on the exam because someone on the board clearly has, has had that tapeworm. Because, <laughs> I mean, that would have to be the rarest of them all. You'll always see that stupid question on there. And probably someone from Chicago because, the, because it's the lake trout in, the, in, the, in those uh, lakes up there that carry that worm. So some Chicago pathologist always put this on the test. And he probably has his tapeworm. Okay. Also, you can have bacterial overgrowth. That means that you have some peristalsis problem there in that small intestine. Maybe you have diverticular pouches there and stasis. Whenever there's stasis, guys, you get bacterial infection. That's true of urine, too. You know, if you have a, a bladder, you know, that, that doesn't uh, peristalse, you're going to get infection. You've got a small intestine that doesn't peristalse. Normally, it doesn't have bacteria. It will after a little while. And so bacterial overgrowth. Bacteria love B12 intrinsic fat. They use it for dessert. And they like salt on their food, too. So they also have bile salt deficiency. They eat bile salts, and they eat B12 intrinsic factor when you have bacterial overgrowth. And then, of course, you can have terminal ileal disease, and that equates with Crohn's disease. All of these things can produce B12 deficiency. Are we with me? Now, how was I able to do all that stuff? Because I know the normal. I know how everything works. Therefore, it's very simple to actually think about causes of each of these things. You don't know the normal, you'll never understand the abnormal. I'm trying to prove that to you all the way through all these lectures. You always go over the normal first, and then we screw it up. Okay? So if you don't know the normal, you'll never understand B12 deficiency. Okay, let's go to folate. Folate's a little interesting. Folate's seen in, in animal and plant products, so you don't, you don't get this from... Um, from being a pure veggie. In fact, pure veggie has got piles of folate. Now, here's a couple of interesting things about folate because folate's where all the pharmacology tie-ins are. Okay, so you really want to listen to this. You already heard one of them, dihydrofolate reductase. There's two more. Uh, folate, when you eat it, is in a polyglutamate form. Okay? Which means you can't reabsorb it in the jejunum. So it has to be converted into a monoglutamate form and there is an enzyme in your small intestine called intestinal conjugase which does that. There is also a drug that blocks intestinal conjugase so that you can't do that. That's called phenytoin. And so if they ask you about someone that's on phenytoin that ends up with a macrocytic anemia with hypersegmented neutrophils, neurologic examination is normal. That just excluded B12. Then they ask you what drug is the patient on? The answer is phenytoin. That's, how, that's its mechanism. Blocks intestinal conjugase. Okay, let's say you have monoglutamate. You're going to resorb, absorb folate in a the, in the, in the jejunum. There's two things that prevent the absorption of monoglutamate form from the jejunum. One is a birth control pill. Two is alcohol. See, that's the main reason why alcoholics, the most common cause of folate deficiency is alcoholism. It actually blocks the reabsorption of folate. Now, the other reason you probably already know is that B12, you know, you've got six to nine years supply in your liver. So that's very uncommon to get deficiency from, from that. But folate only has three to four months. So most of you thought that, well, you only see uh, folate deficiency in these, in these street people that, you know, really just drink all the time and don't eat and all that baloney. Baloney, you can have an excellent diet. You're still not able to reabsorb folate because alcohol blocks the reabsorption of folate. Woo. Okay. All right, so that's folate. Remember we said that the circulating form then of folate when you do reabsorb it is methyl tetrahydrofolate. Who takes the methyl group off? B12. And who does it give it to? Homocysteine, which becomes 
methionine. Very good. What happens to the methyl tetrahydrofolate? What does it become? Tetrahydrofolate, and then you can just see it. Just picture it in your head. Just picture that coming around the bend, and there's this thing down there, which we don't have to name. And there's DNA down there. Dihydrofolate, dihydrofolate reductase, back to tetrahydrofolate. Okay? So, those are the key things related to folate. Okay, now in terms of hematology, this picture right here is uh, the one that they usually select for boards. How do I know that? That guy that I said that took the exam, the first exam, I showed him the hour rod, and he said, that was the exact cell. I already showed you that. Then I showed him this. I said, was this the one? He said, that's the exact one. This is the one they use. Okay? So how do you know it's hypersegmented? Because I said so. No. You know because it has more than five lobes. Okay, so let's count. Okay. Uno, two-o, three-o, four-o, five-o. Notice that, that exception, exceptional Spanish. Okay. So what are we up to? Five-o, right? Uh, six-o, seven-o, eight-o. Okay. You mean that's not Spanish? I got the right accent, don't I? See, most Americans think that all you got to do is use the accent and speak English, and you speak in a foreign language. <laughs> I did that in Italy. Do you uh, understand to me? Okay? My wife's watching me do this. Okay? And so this guy was a smart aleck Italian. He says, Noah Ayadonta. <laughs> this is so cool. The guy was very sharp. Very sharp. <laughs> I actually did that. My wife kicked me in the butt. She says, you idiot. What you're doing is using a... He's using the accent, and, and you just speak in English, you jerk. <laughs> no, whatever. All right, so this is a hypersegmented neutral. Guys, this is so important, this stupid cell, because it means you either have B12 or folate deficiency, even if you don't have anemia. It's the very first thing that comes up even before you have anemia. It's important. It just doesn't suddenly arise here and mean nothing. And if the neurologic exam is normal, then you know it's folate in terms of board purposes. If it's an abnormal neurological, it's B12. Now, the test for proprioception is the Romberg test, okay, which most of you think is a cerebellar test. Okay? Now, Romberg test, you do with the patient standing like there with the hands either this way or out there, right? Okay, you say, close your eyes. Open them. Okay, so that's a negative Romberg test. Okay, I was able to keep myself. But if you have a posterior column disease, you're okay here. Say, close your eyes. Open them. Close them. Open them. Okay? That's the problem with proprioception. Why? Because when I closed my eyes, I didn't know where my joints were. We're not talking marijuana either. I'm talking about these joints. These joints. These joints. Okay? They're not swaying around looking for their joints. Okay? It's because they don't know where they are. When your eyes open, then you have other things that can tell you where you are. You understand this? Now, this is what a person with cerebellar disease would be. Stand still. Close your eyes. Open them. I mean, how could that be a cerebellar test? Okay. I mean, really. Good Lord in heaven. I can't tell you how many students think that a Romberg test is for cerebellar ataxia. That I means whether their eyes are open or closed, they're all over the place. Good Lord in heaven. Okay. Remember, when you got that tuning fork and you're fiddling around with the head, you know, like that, checking for Rene's and, that, and the Weber test, why don't you move it down to the lateral malleolus, too, and see if they have vibratory sensation. You could pick up B12 and the B12 deficiency just like that, absent vibratory sensation. Those are all posterior column things, guys. Okay, so these are the key cells. These, look at the size of these suckers. This is a bone marrow. Look at the size of that nucleus. That's because it never matured. That's why it's called megaloblastic. Now, guys, <clears throat> hematopoietic cells are made outside the sinusoids in the bone marrow. It is analogous to the quartz of Billroth in the spleen. Quartz of Billroth in the spleen is basically a place where there are fixed macrophages. And then the um, RBCs and white blood cells have to get back into the sinusoids in the circulation through these holes. Okay? They get through, and now they're in sinusoid. The same thing happens in the bone marrow. Okay? 
they have a place which would be equivalent to the cords of Bill Roth, and that's where they're made. And then to get into the circulation, they have to fit through these little narrow, couple micron uh, wide holes to get into the sinusoids in the bone marrow to get into the bloodstream. I, 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 I suggest to you, could something that big get through those small slits and get back into the sinusoids, yes or no? No. So you can picture, you can picture a big feast of all these macrophages with all these big megaloblastic cells, piles of them, that can't get into the sinusoids. That's white blood cells, that's red blood cells, that's even platelets. Can't get out. Okay, and the macrophages just kill them, knock all of them off, and just massive carnage. I mean, this is, this is clearly Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of stuff. You have, I mean, blood going all over the place. Probably the macrophages just take a bite out of each thing. Bump, 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 and they just die. Okay, screaming and yelling and all that kind of stuff is going on in there. So what do you see in the peripheral blood? Nothing. Pancytopenia. Severe macrocytic anemia, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia is the characteristic findings of B12 and folate deficiency. Everything's too big in that mouth. Can't get out into the circulation. Schilling's test, and then we're done with the macrocytic anemias. Schilling's, I would have put money on, was British. Shillings, they use that for money. So it has to be British. Turns out it's American. It was amazing. I almost fell over when I found out that Shillings was American. Okay. Now, it's a fantastic test for localizing B12 deficiency. So you've already documented this B12 deficiency. You want to know why. What's the cause of it? Okay. Here's how the test works, guys. The first thing is you, you know they have B12 deficiency, so you give them radioactive uh, B12 uh, by mouth. They swallow it, you collect the urine for 24 hours and see if any of it comes out in the urine. Okay? Nothing came out. So now you proved they're having a problem with reabsorbing B12. Okay? So you just kind of equality controlled it. So there's a problem. Now let's see if we can figure it out. Now I'm going to give you what we're going to do and you're going to tell me what the problem is. Are you ready? The first step is to give radioactive B12 and intrinsic factor together. Okay? Collect the urine for 24 hours, all of a sudden, piles of B12 is in the urine now. What's the disease? Pernicious anemia. Because you added what was missing, intrinsic factor. Let's say it didn't work. What did you exclude? Pernicious anemia. So we've got to do the next step. The next step is give them uh, uh, 10 days worth of blood spectrum antibiotic. Come back in 10 days, you just give them radioactive B12. Piles of radioactive B12 come out in the urine. What'd you, what's the diagnosis? Back to your liver growth, because you knocked off all those bugs that we eat in the B12. Okay. That didn't work. Okay? And we got one thing left in your armamentarium. Pancreatic extract. So you get this couple pills, which is pancreatic extract. Okay, you swallow it. Okay, then you get them radioactive B12 and see what happens. 24 hours later, radioactivity all over the place. What did you diagnose? Chronic pancreatitis. If that didn't work, then it's one of the other things. Could be Crohn's disease, could be a worm that's eating it, or something like that. It's a very simple test, it's commonly asked on boards because it requires you to think. So B12 uh, uh, absorption is, is corrected by adding intrinsic factor, pernicious anemia. Corrected by adding an antibiotic, bacterial overgrowth. Corrected by adding pancreatic extract, pan chronic pancreatitis. Let's see where you do the test. And that is the end of those. Normal acidic anemias. Okay. Now we're going to first deal with those normal acidic anemias where when you do the corrections, okay, correction for the anemia, it turns out on if there's polychromasia, you correct it, the correction is less than 2%. So you're saying, uh-uh, not good. Got a normal acidic anemia and a bone marrow ain't responding correctly. Now, the first two things that you see here is early iron deficiency and anemia chronic disease. And I want you to think of why that's true. Remember I told you that you have to have a normal acidic anemia first before you become microcytic. You just don't overnight go into microcytic. So you still have to have in your differential diagnosis of a normal acidic anemia with a decrease, with a, with a corrective tick count less than 2%, you still have to get a ferritin. That's totally legitimate. In fact, here's how it works in iron deficiency. It goes through these different stages. And let me tell you that the very first thing that happens is that your ferritin levels go down. 
Then the next thing, iron decreased, TIBC increased, percent fat decreased. You still won't have anemia, guys. So in other words, all the iron studies are abnormal before you even have any anemia and iron deficiency. Then you get a mild normal acidic anemia, and then eventually microcytic anemia. Okay? All right. So you still have to do those. All right? Now, why do I say blood loss less than a week? Well, that produces a normal acidic anemia. Okay? Uh, why would you not have an increase in the reticulocyte response? There's nothing wrong with the bone marrow. You just lost blood. Not enough time. I might say you need five to seven days to start getting revved up. Okay, so you could have blood loss as a cause of the normal acidic anemia if it's under a week. After one week, you would get an appropriate response. Okay? Other things, aplastic anemia. What does that mean? It means you have no, no marrow. Of course, if that's true, what do you think they would have in the peripheral blood? If they had no, if all the hematopoietic cells were destroyed in the marrow, what would you expect to see in terms of the peripheral blood? Pancytopenia. You have Normal acidic anemia, thrombocytopenia, neutropenia. Everything is decreased. You've got to do bone marrow. got to do bone marrow. Kind of look like this. Okay, that's a normal marrow. That's a marrow with, that's aplastic. You don't see anything. That's the spicules there. The rest of this is just plain old fat. Okay, this is a normal. That's aplastic anemia. Okay? Very common. Very easy diagnosis to make. Uh, in terms of, of causes of this, most cases they can't figure out. Whenever they can't figure out something, you know what word they always use? Idiopathic, don't they? Okay. You should probably have a T in it. Idiopathic. Okay. Because most of the time, they just haven't had a real good history. Especially here in this country. Okay. You learn, you learn, and a lot of times in, in, in your country, especially if it's British, British thing, you learn the importance of a history and physical exam. In this country, it's not, it's not pushed that much. Okay. Everything's lab, 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 lab. Of course, the British think we're a bunch of idiots, and they're probably right. Because of the fact that, look at those Americans over there, they always get laboratory, laboratory. We could just look at the patient and make a diagnosis. Okay. And so they stay in there in the room looking at the patient. The patient's looking at them. <laughs> yeah, that's the way it is. You look at the patient, you make the diagnosis. You go there and you go right to the bed. What do they do? They hit you over the head with a two by four. <laughs> You fail. Go back. You start all over again. Okay. Got to look at the patient first. The person will, the patient will tell you what they have. Okay. Look at them. All right. Okay. Get a life. All right. Okay. Then you got to do a thorough history and physical. Okay. Now what do you do? Laboratory. <laughs> That's what the Americans do. What is the matter with you? You tell me what you expect to say. I expect this, this, and this. Good. Let's go. All right, that's the end of it. No laboratory. <laughs> okay, so they can take that to an extreme a little bit. Okay. All right, so that was cool. That was good. I never did that one before. Uh, and so you got to get a real good history. What drugs are you on? Drugs? I don't take drugs. Yeah. Okay, we're talking about prescriptions. Okay, and so you go through all of them because drugs would be the most common. Uh, known cause of aplastic anemia. You learned a whole pile of these different drugs. Now, now, now how many people are going to say, well, I'm taking chloramphenicol right now. I mean, how many people are going to be saying that? Nobody! <laughs> okay, so, you know, chloramphenicol is the cause of aplastic anemia. It's retarded because, you know, no one's on it. In fact, if they are on it, report the doctor to the, to the society for getting him disbarred. I mean, you just don't use chloramphenicol, except in rare situations. Rocky Mountain spotted fever is one of them. It's a great drug for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. But whatever. You've got to think of other things, okay? Like things like uh, uh, the uh, indomethacin and some of those drugs, phenylbutazone, and things that are thyroid-related drugs. In other words, drugs, okay? And check out the PDR and see, you know, if they can produce marrow depression. Okay, so always good drugs. Second infections. And one of the biggest infections of aplastic anemia is uh, hepatitis C. If you have a, a purely an aplasia of red blood cells and everything else is okay, it's just the red blood cells that are totally destroyed, what virus? Parvovirus, very good. But when everything's destroyed, hepatitis C is the usual cause of that. Okay, and then of course radiation can do it. So drugs is the big thing. And then infection, hepatitis C, if it's just the red blood cells that are out, parvovirus, and then radiation would be the main causes of it. And that's it for aplastic anemia.
I want you to tell me the mechanism of a normal cytic anemia less than 2% corrected drug or tick count in renal failure. What's the mechanism? Decreased erythropoietin. Do we have erythropoietin available to give to somebody? Sure. Okay. It's made by recombinant DNA, and it's revolutionized the treatment of anemia in, uh, in uh, chronic renal failure. So they no longer have to get, you know, blood to, uh, uh, to, to incorrect their anemia. So that's decreasing hepatitis B, C, and HIV. So it's a wonderful thing. Of course, if you don't have any in your hospital, just go to a professional cyclist, okay, who all taking it, who's using it as doping. Okay, that's when they say doping. The last least of doping, what they're taking is erythropoietin to increase their amount of uh, red blood cells to carry more oxygen so they can last longer. And that's what they're, they're doing very commonly now in professional sports. And that's it. Those are the normal cytic anemias. Corrective at tick count less than 2%. Early iron deficiency, anemia chronic disease, aplastic anemia, chronic renal failure, blood loss less than a week. Malignancy, another one. All right, now this is the more fun one. The normal cytic anemias where the corrective at tick count is greater than 3%. But before we do these, we have to go over mechanisms. Mechanisms of hemolysis. Okay, and students get a little bit screwy on this thing, so we'll go a little slow on this. There's two ways that you can kill a red blood cell. You can kill it intravascularly. Now, intra means within the vessel. You can kill it. That's not too common. Or you can kill it extravascularly. What's extra mean? Outside of the vessel. Now, let's think about that one. That's the one students don't get. What do you mean outside the vessel? How are you going to kill something outside a blood vessel? Macrophage. It means a macrophage killed the red blood cell. It took it out, so to speak. We're in it to take it out. Quartz of Bill Roth usually in the spleen. Sometimes in the liver sinusoids they have fixed macrophages, but mainly the quartz of Bill Roth. And every red blood cell has to take a couple trips a day through the quartz of Bill Roth and be examined in the dark by a macrophage. Can you just imagine going into this dark room and somebody is feeling all over your body? Okay? And you're just praying. You're just praying there's nothing on the surface. Okay? You didn't pick up an IgG or a C3B because if you did, it would be something like this. <laughs> That's it. Why is there no further sound? You've been phagocytosed and destroyed because the macrophage has receptors for IgG and C3B. You're dead. Okay, well, what if you don't have IgG and C3B? Well, you could still die. Why? Because you're in bad shape. I mean, you're out of shape? In a sense. You're a sphere. How is a sphere going to fit through a two-micron hole to get into the sinusoids? It can't. And you can see it's trying. Bonk! Bonk! And you can just see the macrophages smiling in the dark. You having trouble getting out? Yeah! How come it never finished the yes? It was phagocytose and killed. Okay? <laughs> so spherocytes are going to be removed extravascularly. They can't get out. Neither can a sickle cell. They have a bad shape. They can't get out through the two micron slit. Okay. What else can take them out? They got something inside of them that wasn't removed. Like what? A piece of nucleus. That's called a Howell Jolly body. Well, a macrophage will try to get that out. Why? Because it's like a monkey. It's like, that's like insects for it. You know, it says, ooh, 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 there's something inside of you. Let me pick it out. Okay? okay? Sometimes they can take it out without killing the cell. Sometimes, you know, someone that's not paying attention can take too much membrane out and dies. So that's called extravascular hemolytic anemias. So in review, those anemias would be due to IgG or C3B on the surface. Those are autoimmune hemolytic anemias. Okay, or you have an abnormal shape, like a sphere or a sickle cell, you ain't going to make it out of the spleen, you get removed by macrophages, extravascular. So that's the concept there. Now what's the end product of phagocytosing and RBC? Unconjugated bilirubin is the answer. Because when that RBC is broken down and you've got hemoglobin, there's an enzyme in there that splits heme from globin, and the globin is broken up into amino acids and it goes into the amino acid pool. And then it takes the heme thing, splits that open, gets the iron, and says, let's save this. Now you've got protoporphyrin, and it just keeps on breaking it down, and eventually ends up as bilirubin. In the macrophage, in the, in the spleen. 
And then that's spit out of the macrophage into the bloodstream. Remember, that's lipid soluble, unconjugated bilirubin, binds to albumin, goes to the liver, and it's taken up and conjugated. So, what clinical finding do you see in patients with extravascular hemolytic anemia? Jaundice. There you go. I'm going to ask you a simple question. Does any of that bilirubin get in the urine? No. Two reasons why it isn't. One, it's lipid soluble. Two, it's bound to albumin. Albumin don't get in the urine. So you're jaundiced, but you don't have any of it in your urine. Now, intravascular is a less common type of a hemolytic anemia. That means you die within the vessel. Well, how do you do that? Well, you die within the vessel if you bang into something. That should be there. Like maybe, remember that congenital bicuspid aortic valve with all that calcium there? What if you banged into that on your way out through the, uh, through the uh, uh, aorta? You think maybe you would damage yourself, maybe be smashed into an oblivion and die intravascularly? Sure. Absolutely, you can get intravascular. What if you had IgM that was on the surface of your red blood cell, that red blood cell? Okay? Uh, what's that going to do? Didn't remember I said that it's the most potent activator of the complement system? Is it going to stop at, is it going to go from 1 to 9, or is it going to stop at C3 like IgG does? It's going to go to 1 to 9, which means that it's going to sit on that red blood cell, <coughs> uh, uh, activate the complement system, and it's going to be a hole made in that, and it dies intravascularly. So anything that's IgM mediated will be intravascular hemolysis. Okay. So that would be the kinds of things there. So what are you going to release into the bloodstream if you're killing the red blood cell intravascularly? Hemoglobin. Well, that's a valuable commodity in our bodies, guys, because we don't want to lose hemoglobin in our urine. We're going to lose some anyway, but we want to retrieve some of it back so we can use, get the amino acids out of it and get, certainly don't lose the iron. And so there's a specific protein that's made in the liver whose only function in life is kind of like the Maytag person who over there has nothing to do. Okay, this particular protein usually has nothing to do because there's not a whole lot of intravascular hemolysis going on. So it's just waiting around for something to do. Anybody know the name of the protein? Haptoglobin. Sometimes called the suicide protein, actually, because when there is intravascular hemolysis and there's all this hemoglobin, it binds to it and then forms a complex which is phagocytose by a macrophage and so it gives its life, in a sense, to retrieve the hemoglobin. And so then what happens to the haptoglobin levels in patients with intravascular hemolysis? They decrease. Is it possible to get jaundice with this? Yeah, but usually you don't because if the macrophage is phagocytosing, if there is that potential for because the hemoglobin is broken down, but it usually not, usually not. And so the key thing for intravascular hemolysis is you get hemoglobinuria and you have low haptoglobin levels. That's what marks that particular thing. You understand that so far? So what are the two mechanisms for hemolysis? Extravascular, intravascular. When I say extravascular, who removes them? Macrophage. What's the end product of that? Unconjugated bilirubin. What's the clinical manifestation? John, you got it. You have intravascular hemolysis, then what happens in your urine? What do you see? Hemoglobin. And what's decreased? Haptoglobin. Good. You got it. Those are the key things. Now, this is probably not as important, the concept of intrinsic versus extrinsic. Uh, so we'll just uh, take our break and then we'll decide whether we're going to talk about that or not. Probably not.